start with a new chapter which is quadrilaterals. So, we know what a point is. So, this is a point. Now, we said that a collection of points, right? A collection of points becomes a line, right? Now, then we talked about triangles. We talked about triangles. So, triangles basically have three vertex, right? There are three vertex for a triangle. For a triangle ABC, we find three vertex. Now, what if we get four vertex for a figure? One, two, three and four. We form a new polygon, right? What is polygon first of all? Polygon is any shape. So, a four cornered or vertexed polygon is known as a quadrilateral. So, in this chapter, we learn a lot about what are quadrilaterals and what are different types of them and what are their properties. So, we would be learning about the quadrilaterals in this chapter. So, first of all, types of quadrilaterals. We have seen a lot of uh, like four cornered objects in our day-to-day -day lives, right? Even our mobile phones have like four corners when it when we are talking about two dimensional things mobile phone is a three dimensional object but still when we are looking at it we saw the two dimensional view of it right so when we see the two dimensional view of it we just see it as a rectangle right so rectangle is a quadrilateral we are already familiar with figures like square a rectangle right and some of you might know the shape of a diamond right all these comes under quadrilaterals. Now we learn a little bit more about, we will go a little bit deeper into what are quadrilaterals. And let us see what are the types of quadrilaterals. First quadrilateral we are talking about here is a parallelogram. A parallelogram is a special kind of four-sided four sided shape just like a rectangle or square. But unlike a rectangle or square, the angles inside the parallelogram do not have a 90 degrees. So basically, Parallelogram is something, is a shape, is a rectangle with a not 90 degree angle. So, when we are talking about a rectangle, we have four 90 degree angles here, right, in the four corners. Now, when we are talking about parallelogram, it is a slanted version of a rectangle. That is, all these angles, all these four angles are not 90 degrees are, or are not right angles. So, that is what a parallelogram is. So, let us see a few properties of parallelograms which is very interesting. First of all, opposite sides are always equal. Just like a rectangle, if we are talking about a rectangle, we know that this side and this side are equal and this side and this side are equal. In the same case of parallelogram, both these sides are equal and this side's length would be equal to this side's length. Now, opposite angles are equal. So, when in case of a rectangle, all four angles are 90 degrees. So, when we are changing the angle, we are slanting the rectangle, right? So, it means that this angle and this angle is equal. That is, opposite angles of a parallelogram are equal. Now, let us see. So, for a parallelogram, this angle would also be equal to this angle. That is, two opposite angles would be equal in a case of a parallelogram. Now, the angles add up to 360 degrees. If you were to measure all the angles inside a parallelogram and add them up, you will get 360 degrees. What is it said here? It said that the sum of interior angles is equal to 360 degrees. So, it is said that the sum of inter interior angle, what are interior angle? Interior angle are the angles which are present inside of a shape, right? So, there is a very particular things to notice about some things. We talked about rectangle, uh, triangle, rectangle and all, right? So, there is a very, very interesting thing about the interior angles or the sum of the interior angles and the sum of the exterior angles of these shapes. So, first of all, the sum of interior angles of every shape, right? For a triangle, we know that it is equal to 180 degree for a triangle, right? Now, when we are talking about a quadrilateral, any shape with four 
vertex what do we do is we actually split them into maximum number of triangles right so here from one vertex to another vertex if we draw a diagonal we get one and two two triangles so what would be the sum of interior angles sum of interior angles would be 180 into 2 that is 360 degree for a quadrilateral for every quadrilateral this sum of interior angles would be 360 degree and what about the sum of exterior angles what are exterior angles first of all let's say i am extending this line so i extended this line extended this line i am extending every single line of a parallelogram right so this would go on like this this would go on like this and this would go on like this this angles these four angles right all these four angles are called the exterior angles this one so these four angles are called the exterior angle not this one it's this one yeah these four angles are called the exterior angle of a quadrilateral so what is the sum of exterior angles of a quadrilateral for every polygons not just quadrilaterals every polygons the sum of exterior angles the the sum of exterior angles of every polygon would be equal to 360 degrees so now we know what is the sum of internal angles of a parallelogram and what is the sum of exterior angles of a parallelogram so for any quadrilateral the interior angle and the exterior angle is 360 degrees right now let's move on to the next quadrilateral the next quadrilateral we are talking about here is a rhombus so what is a rhombus we just said that when a rectangle is slanted a little bit it becomes a parallelogram right now what is a slanted square so this is a square now we made it a little bit slanted like all four sides are equal but we made it a little bit slanted so what is it now a slanted square becomes a rhombus so imagine a rhombus as a special kind of shape that looks like a squished diamond so you know this rhombus this square I am saying that it is a slanted square, so this becomes a rhombus. So if we actually turn this shape, we get this, right? This is like a squished diamond. Diamonds look like this, right? Right? We just see crystals all over, right? Now, if this diamond is squished, it becomes a rhombus. It is a flat two-dimensional figure with four sides of equal length, but the corners are not right angles like square or a rectangle. So, in squares and rectangle, we have, in the case of square, we have four equal sides with all four side, four angles to be 90 degrees, right? Now, in case of a rectangle, we have two equal sides with 90 degrees on each corner, right? Now, when we talked about parallelogram, we just slightly tilted it, so the angle differed, right? Now, that becomes a parallelogram. Now, when we are talking about rhombus, we take a square, change the angles of 90 degree, into some other angles and we get a rhombus now what are the properties of rhombus equal side all the sides of a rhombus are equal in length so you won't have any sides longer or shorter than the others so it's basically square in a slanted way right just the angle change so all the si four sides would be equal opposite angles are equal see the opposite angles in a rhombus are equal if you draw two lines from one corner to the opposite corner they will meet at a point the angles formed by those lines will also be equal. Why? If we are taking a bisector of this. So, imagine I am taking bisector of every angle. Right? I am taking a bisector here. Also, I am taking a bisector here. Right? So, this will meet at a point. Right? Now, the angles formed by this line and this line would be equal angle it here and here would be equal here and here would be equal right why because opposite angles are already equal and we have the same length right right 
Now diagonals are perpendicular. There are two special lines inside the rhombus called diagonals. So what we draw right now is a line connecting from one vertex to another vertex, right? So this is a line from one vertex to another vertex. So these kind of lines are called as diagonals. If we are drawing a diagonal for a rhombus, it would be like this. It would connect both the ends, two opposite vertex. A line connecting two opposite vertex are called a diagonal, right? For a rectangle, the diagonal becomes like this and this, right? Again, for a parallelogram, the diagonal goes like this. Now, they are like long x lines connecting opposite corners. What's cool about <laughs> these diagonals cross each other at the right angle just like the corner of a square. So what is the property of the diagonal of a rhombus? It cross each other at 90 degree angle. Now let's move on to the next shape, a rectangle. We already know about what a rectangle is. Requ re a rectangle is a four size shaped like a stretched out box or a table with opposite sides that have same length or same four sharp corners. So we have four sharp corners, right? Now, we have same length here and here, also same length here and here, here too. This is the same length of this and this is the same length of here, right? Now, let's move on to the next shape which is a trapezium. A trapezium is a special kind of four-sized shape, four-sided shape, right? It's a bit like rectangle or a square. But it's different because it have two sides as that are parallel, which they mean they run side by side. So trapezium have two sets of parallel lines. Let's say we have two one pair of parallel lines like this and another par pair of parallel lines, another pair of lines like this. So we are intersecting these lines and we get a trapezium called A, B, C and D, right? So this is a trapezium. So, what is the, how do we find this height of a trapezium? It's basically very simple. From one corner up, we'll connect it to the bottom line. This is the height of a trapezium. In this side, this becomes the height of a trapezium. So, how do we find the area of a trapezium? The area of a trapezium is very simple concept. What do we have here? We have two right angle triangle and one square or a rectangle, right? This would be a rectangle and these two would be triangles. So what would be the area of a trapezium? It would be half of breadth into height here, again half of breadth into height, that means breadth into height, plus the area of a rectangle is length into breadth, right? Yeah, the sum of all this would give us the area of a trapezium. Now, uh, we have kite. So what is kite? We have seen kites all around, right? I mean, you have seen kites fl like flying in the sky. We like, you know, we play with kites a lot. So the shape of kite, what is it called? It's again called kite. That's why, you know, yeah. Now, a geometric shape that looks like diamond. So if we place this kite like this, right? Now, it does, it should look like a diamond. I mean, yeah, it have two pairs of sides and each pair of sides are equal in length. That means this sides are equal in length and this sides are equal in length, right? Now, let's see some properties of kites. There are four sides. A kite have four sides and they're connected in a way that it looks like a diamond, right? Two pairs of equal sides. Among these four sides, there are two pairs of sides that have same length and it means that the opposite sides are equal. That is, this side and this side is equal and this side and this side is equal. Diagonals. The two longer diagonals of a kite are the lines that are connected from opposite corners of a kite. So we are connecting these two vertex and these two vertex, right? They are not equal in length, but they cross each other in a right angle. Now, angles. The angles at the top and the bottom of the kite are equal. So the angles which is formed here and which is formed here is equal. Then, uh, and the angles at the left and right corners are equal as well. So this and this is equal and this and this angle are equal. So opposite angles are equal, right? No right angles. So there is no right angle in, you know, a kite. In rhombus, we had the diagonal crossing its right angle. Here also the diagonal is crossed as right angle, right? Now, 
it does have one right angle where the shorter diagonal meets the longer di diagonal. Now symmetry, a kite has a line of symmetry which means you can fold it in half along one of its diagonals and both sides will match perfectly, right? Yeah. Now let's talk about circles. Now we have been talking about pol uh, like polygons, right? We said that we formed four vertex and we get a square. Right? Now, what if we have five vertex? So, this becomes a pentagon. Right? Now, what if this is a pentagon? It has five sides. Five sides is called pentagon. Now, if it has six vertex, one, two, three, four, five, six. Right? One, two, three, four, five and six. This have six vertex. It's called a hexagon. Now, if we have seven vertex, it's called a heptagon. And if it have eight vertex, it's called an octagon. So, what happens if we have n vertex? So, let's see what is happening. When we are increasing vertex, right, it is becoming more circular. Like, this is not even close to circle. But if we are considering a circle here, right, when we are connecting all the vertex, right? Now we imagine we increased all the vertex. Now all the vertex would come together, right? All the vertex would come together and it will form a figure called a circle. A circle is just a simple round shape with no corners and is definite, defined by its special radius and diameter. So what is a circle? We see, these are the few geometrical figures we see in everyday life, right? We see squares, we see rectangles, we see circles. Everybody know what a circle is. What is a circle, right? Now, what defines a circle? We could say that a circle is a collection of points away from the center at a distance r. What do I mean by this? So, I am taking a radius r from the center of a plane and I am saying it is 2 cm. So, what is a circle? Circle is a collection of point which is 2 cm away from the center of the circle. Right? So, it is a collection of point which is 2 cm or r cm or r meters away from the defined point. Right? So, we see a beautiful pictures and like you know used with circles and this is a beautiful architecture which uses circles. So, circles is a very beautiful shape which is a collection of n number of vertex. Now, let us study a little bit more about what are circles. Now, first of all, let us talk about the arc of a circle. We have heard a lot about arcs. So, what are arcs? Arcs are actually a part of the edge of the circle, right? So, I am just say that I am taking a compass. I am fixing my compass on the paper and I have my pencil connected to it, right? I am just drawing like a, a small dash, not completely a circle. I am just drawing a small dash. That dash we get there is called the arc of the circle, right? It is as if you took a piece of the circle and just cut it out. So, instead of going all the way around the circle, you only look at a little portion of it. Arcs can also be measured in degrees. How do we measure arc in degrees? Let us say this is the center of the circle. So, this would be radius r, right? And this would also be radius r. So, if this is the arc, what is this? This would be, let us say, x degrees. So, x degrees is the measure of the arc, right? How much is it? Arcs can also be measured in degrees, just like angles. A full circle have 360 degrees. So, if you have an arc that covers half of the circle's edge, it would be 180 degrees. What do we say here? If we have a circle, right, what is the angle here? The angle would be 360 degrees, right? Now, we say that we have an arc which covers the half of the circle. So, what is the angle of this arc? It would be 180 degrees, right? Now, let us see what is the chord of a circle. A straight line that connects two points on the circle's edge is called a chord of a circle. So, what is a chord? Now, we know that what is an arc. We could say that this is an arc, right? Now, what is a chord? So, imagine a circle like this, right? 
and I am choosing two points on two points on the circle. Now, if we connect two points in the circle, the line segment, right, that connects two points of the circle is called the code of a circle. A circle could have multiple codes. We draw a code from AB, right? Now, from A, I could draw another code saying AC. Or other than that, I could draw a completely entirely different code, say uh, DA, D, N, right? Now, I could draw a chord like this, connecting two points. This is also a chord, right? Let's name it PQ, right? So, a circle could have n number of chords in it, right? Infinite number of chords we could draw. It just have to connect two points from a circle. Now, let's talk about what secant is. Two lines that start from the center of the circle and go through circle's edge. These are called the secants. Let's say there's a center here. Now, we draw two lines and these lines are passing through the edges of the circle and these lines are called secants of the circle. Now, what is a semicircle? So, half of a circle is called a semicircle, right? Now, this has some properties here. See this beautiful picture where a semicircle is used, right? We see a lot of windows and all which looks very beautiful, right? Now, Let's talk about the properties of semicircle. This is a semicircle, right? Let's say this is the center. Let's complete the circle. So we have a circle which is completed here. And that's a semicircle. Half of it I took it as a semicircle. Now let's say that we have a point here, point A, right? Now I'm joining this point from here and from here, okay? And I'm taking another point from here or let's say from the two sides, okay? Now, this point, let's call it B. Now, let's take another point, C. There's a speciality for all these angles. The thing is, angle A would be equal to angle B and this would be equal to angle C. So, if we are taking diameter as the base of the uh, you know, uh, triangles we are getting here. Every angle which have a vertex on the semicircle would have the same measure. So, angle A, angle B and angle C would have the same measure. Now, let's talk about the segment of a circle. So, what is a segment of a circle? Segment means it's a part, right? It's a part of the circle. So, if I'm taking a circle like this, right? And I'm saying this much segment. This is the collected segment of a circle. So, this part of a circle is called the segment of a circle. Right? Now, let's move on to the next thing. Central angle. We've talked about interior angle of quadrilaterals, right? We've talked about what are interior angles which is on the vertex. Now, for cer uh, circles, we have central angle instead of interior angles. Now, think about a line that starts from the center and goes all the way till the edge of the circle. This line creates an angle between itself and another line connecting the center to any point on the circle's edge. This angle is called a central angle. So, here it is represented as phi. Phi is actually a Greek alphabet denoted like this. But still, we could uh, call it as x or y or anything. Right? So, we have a circle and this is the center of the circle. We are imagining there is a line, right? Let's say circle is, center is O and we have a point A here. So, this, I'm taking this line to reference, right? Now, I'm saying that there is a line here, say OB. This angle would be the central angle of OAB, right? Now, I'm taking the line here to be C, right? Now, this would be the angle, this would be the central angle. The size of the central angle tells us how wide it is when you look at it from the center of the circle. If the angle is bigger, it means it covers more of the circle and if it's smaller, it covers less of the circle. Right? Now, let's move on to sector. A sector of a circle is a part that is formed by two straight lines starting from the center and uh, of the circle and going to the edge. So, we have two lines from the center of the circle, this line and this line. What would be the measure of this line? 
it would be the radius of the circle but these particular two lines cover a part of the circle now the shaded area is called a sector now we talked about segments what were segments segments we are taking two points on the edges of the circle right now this is actually a segment now what is a sector sector we are taking two lines from the center of the circle to the edges and the uh, part between them is called the sector of the circle now quadrant of a circle now what we are doing is we take a circle we divide it into four parts so we have four quadrants here now let's imagine that for this circle i'm drawing a graph i'm drawing a graph and i'm taking this point the center to be the origin right now this would be my x axis this would be my minus x axis this would be my y axis and this would be my minus y axis right so what happens in quadrant 1 if i take any point in quadrant 1 what happens is that x would be positive and y would also be positive so in i am seeing the quarter of a circle is a quadrant right what is the quadrant of a circle we divide the circle into four parts four equal parts these each of these parts are called the quadrants of the circle so this would be our first quadrant this would be our second quadrant this is our third quadrant and this is our fourth quadrant now in quadrant 1 this is the top right part of the circle in this quadrant both x coordinate and the y coordinate are positive so all the points no matter what point i take in the circle it would be positive now second quadrant is the top left part of the circle in this quadrant x become negative why it's lesser than 0 huh and y becomes positive so all the points that it have negative x values but positive y values now consider the third quadrant third quadrant is a quadrant which is in the bottom left of the circle in this quadrant both the x coordinates and the y coordinates are negative so here we have x negative when we are taking a point here we have both x values and y values to be negative right now when we are talking about the fourth quadrant here the fourth quadrant lies in the bottom right corner in this corner x quadrant is positive and y is negative so these are the four quadrants of a circle 